So in lab two, we actually get to start um, writing queries. And I don't know if any of you guys saw um, from the announcement, um, I posted a little video just about general select statements and we're gonna cover that again today. Um, maybe with just a little bit more. I tried to keep those videos nice and short so that's not too much. So you can kind of just blip through real quick, but <clears throat> real quick, just so we can kind of get an idea of what the lab is expecting of us. Um, I just wanted to go through some of these objectives. So reinforces how to run scripts from command line. And just as an FYI, if it ever says reinforces, that means that it's not anything new. It means that it's something that you've already seen before. So in this case, it's reinforcing how to run scripts from command line. Um, use the at symbol. We're going to show that again. This time we're actually going to do it even more because last time we kind of ran um, some things, just copied them into the terminal. This time I'm actually going to run the script every time. Um, the second one is how to query the data dictionary for elements of your database model. We're going to do a little bit of that um, today. So I'll show you how we can use that to, to kind of write our queries because I'm going to try and kind of show you how this works even in real life what I do every day. Um, and then we're going to learn how to write single table queries um, with and without where clause filters. We're going to write single table queries with basic aggregation functions. Um, and then we're going to filter based on wild cards, null values, and use pipe concatenation or other lookup operators like some of these here. So we're going to go over some of these. Um, and, and I'm just going to kind of go through the lab with you guys. Um, I'm not going to solve every solution for you, but I do kind of want to talk. And so that way there's no surprises. You kind of see what you're getting yourself into. So just so you know, I'm going to keep this here over on my left monitor. So if you want to have it up at the same time, know that that's kind of what I'm going to be using as our guide here. Um, before we get too crazy, the other thing I want to let you know is you might come across some instructions um, that talk about Postgres. And they're just getting ready for next semester um, because right now we're kind of in a weird place where they're actually piloting it on campus. Um, also with Oracle 18C. So we're on Oracle 11G. Um, so you can, for the most part, ignore anything that talks about Postgres and anything that talks about 18C. Um, we're only using Oracle 11G. So, um, and for the most part, I'm gonna kind of show you what we're doing here. Um, it kind of looks a little bit, the instructions always make it seem more complicated than what it actually is, in in my opinion. So, what we're gonna do is we are just gonna dive right in here. And it talks, it says write your solution for the 10 steps in the apply Oracle lab 2.sql file. So that's what we're kinda gonna do. Um, so I'm actually just gonna, let's open up our lab 2 file. Cause we're just gonna put everything right in there. So we're gonna go, and I guess this reiteration, this is only week two. Um, we're gonna open up our files by hitting our little F icon down here, a little start menu, clicking on file manager. Then we're going to go to data, CIT 225, Oracle, Lab 2. And you can see in here this apply Oracle Lab 2.sql. Now I have a couple extra files in here and I just made these for my video um, that I made just this week. So, <clears throat> and if you haven't seen those, check them out on YouTube. They're actually really nice because they're nice and short. So for whatever reason you need a refresher, um, you can always watch this again, but those are actually really condensed um, and it might just be what you need later on so then there's links to those announcements. all right so let's dive in here so if we open up this lab 2 file if we open up this lab 2 file you'll notice that there's all some stuff already in there and specifically you'll notice that um, there's a call to apply oracle lab 1 and just to kind of show you where we're at so i'm actually going to open up a console right now and I'm actually just going to get to where we need to be. So you can get there manually by going CD data, CIT 225, Oracle Lab 2. Or you can open up your little window here, right click and say actions, open terminal here. And the outcome is exactly the same. So up to you how you want to do it, but you can do it either way. And then to log into the database, we're going to type SQL plus student forward slash student. And now we're connected. Now to run this, um, to reinforce how to run it, we're going to 
do the at symbol and then the name of the file that we're at. So apply Oracle lab 2.sql and you'll notice that it actually runs all of lab one. So when we, when we finish this, you'll actually get your lab one is complete. Um, and then as well in here, you'll get all your gobbledygook stuff, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so once we do that, we're all up and running, which and the nice thing is, is for the most part, we all should be there. And it gives you this nice little place where it says enter code below and enter lab code above. So that's kind of where we're going to be working today. Um, we're just going to work right inside this little space and we're just going to start writing queries, um, which is actually to me, writing queries is one of the funner parts about databases. So I'm glad we get to start right off with it. So when we write a query, what we're doing is we're pulling data back out of our database. That's the kind of the point of the database, right? Is we're going to store data, but eventually we want to pull it back out. And that's what we're doing here. And the way this lab is written is you kind of have um, problems, I guess you could say. Um, I like to think of it like, okay, your boss or your supervisor, whoever cares, came to you and says, I need this data and you got to give it to them. Basically, we're writing reports. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to, and it always says use the following ERD, and ERD stands for um, relationship diagram. Um, and basically, it lets us see the table, right? And this gives us an idea of what the table is and the data type that's there, which is important because when we select something, we kind of need to know what we're looking for. Um, so, you know, so if someone says, oh, I need everybody's account number and credit card number, you know what the column names are so we can pull it. Um, so the pictures are there, but I kind of want to show you the other way that you can actually pull it right out of the database. So when we're in here, what we can do is if you're curious about what a table might have, you can use the describe command, D-E-S-C. And let me actually see if I can make this just a tad bit bigger. Uh, let's see. I think we edit the current profile. There we go. Maybe. Maybe not. I'm not quite sure. Oh, in large font. There we go. There we go. That might be a little bit easier to see. Okay, so we use the describe command or for shortcut DESC. And then, uh, then the name of the table. So in this case, if we take a look at our instructions, um, we are returning stuff from the member table. So if we want to take a look at the member table, we can do DESC member. And it'll actually tell us all the columns um, and the data type and whether they're not nullable or not. But we'll talk about that later. But for right now, the important part is we can see the name of the column and we can kind of see what the data type is. So our, our credit card number is a varchar2, which is a string. So it's just a list of characters. Now that's kind of one way. The other way I kind of like to look it up is just by selecting everything from member um, because then you can actually see the data. And sometimes that's uh, more helpful. Sometimes it's less helpful depending on how many rows are on the table where we only have eight. I think it's kind of helpful because we can see it just a little bit better. So I'm going to actually change my line size to 200 and rerun that so we can see a little bit better. So then you can kind of get an idea of what we're looking at you know, our account number, our credit card number, that sort of thing. All right, so let's, let's get back to the instructions. So your boss comes to you and he says, hey, I need you to write a query or, you know, they, they don't ever say it like that. They say, hey, I need everybody's account number and credit card number. So you say, okay. Um, and, and kind of the way to interpret this, because you'll notice that it says returns the account number and credit card number. I'm going to show you a little trick. So when we write a query, it all starts with, the, basically, if you hear the word query, we're writing a select statement. We are selecting data. So we type select, and then whatever we want to return, whatever we want to output, whatever we want to select or see, we list here. So in this case, like in the instruction said, we want to list the account number and credit card number. So in this case, we're going to say account number, right? Just like it was up here, 
account number. So in that case, account underscore number and credit underscore card underscore number. Because that's what we want to see. That's what we want the database to spit out at us, essentially. Um, and then we need to tell where we want to pull this data from. And in this case, we want to pull those column values from the member table. So that's the next part of our select statement is the from clause. And the from clause is pretty simple because we just say from and then table name. Now, this is actually a pretty simple one because this actually is all that there is to a pretty basic query. And I'm going to just say step one there, put a little comments in my code. And I'm going to hit save. And let's run this and see what we get. So if I run at apply oracle lab one dot SQL. Oh, and you'll notice that it says it didn't, it's unable to open the file lab one because the lab one file isn't there. We're in the lab two directory and only the lab two dot SQL file exists. So let's run the lab two one. And there we go. And so now we can see our step one here. And we can see that we selected the account number, credit card number from member. And instead of getting everything that we got before the whole table, now we only see these two columns. So if we want, we can choose what we want to see from a certain table. Now you'll notice that, that we still got eight rows. So we got all the information. Um, so it's gonna give us that data for every row. Does anyone have any questions about that basic, this basic one? And it's fine. The important thing to remember out of this one is the select clause is show, is determines what we see, what it gives back to us. And the from clause is us specifying where we want to get that data from. And if, if at any time you guys have any questions, feel free just to uh, put a question in the chat and I can take care of it. In fact, I highly encourage it because it makes, um, it just helps because if you have that question, odds are someone else does and it also helps me gauge if I'm going too, too quickly. So if a question comes up, let us know. <clears throat> All right, let's go on to step two. And this one's gonna be very similar, except for we're gonna select three columns, um, which, is, which is quite easy. So uses the following ERD to write a query that returns the first name, middle name, and last name column values from the contact table. You know, we can look at this picture right here, but um, I like to just describe contact, kind of see it. Um, so someone asked, knowing SQL, am I going to have a lot of stumbling blocks working with Oracle? Oracle uses SQL. Um, if, you have, you're, if you're used to working with MySQL, um, there's very minor differences. Once you learn one, you kind of got them all. So. So no, nope, shouldn't be any stumbling box for sure. In fact, it's a, very much an advantage if you've already worked with SQL before. In fact, they all kind of use a SQL standard for the most part. There's just little differences like data types and stuff like that. All right, so for this one, in fact, you know what, let's, let's do this. Let's have a little exercise. In the chat, it is, um, if you guys want, make sure you hit shift when you hit return so you don't send the, the thing. Um, let's see. Uh, Someone give this one a shot. It should be just nice and quick. Um, let's see if you can write a select statement. So number two, we're gonna see who can solve it real fast in the chat. We wanna select the first name, middle name, and last name from the contact table. And what I kinda of like about it is if you read it like that, you know, you'll notice that I swapped out returns for select. I wanna select the first, middle, and last name column values from the contact table. It gets really easy. So in the chat, if you want, Perfect, yep, we've already got a couple right answers, so you guys are right on it. So, so yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I don't think I've seen a wrong one yet. So we select the first name, the middle name, and the last name from contact. I'm gonna go ahead and save. I'm gonna hit the up arrow twice and rerun this. And there we go. 
And now you'll notice we get the first, middle, and last name, just like we expected, right? Nothing too crazy there. Great job. Um, so anyways, those ones are pretty simple. Um, you know, nice and easy, just it has two clauses. Um, and you'll hear the word clause a lot. Um, a select statement has multiple clauses. Not all of them are required. You can kind of add them as we go. So this is kind of what I consider to be about as simple as you can get. Select something from somewhere. You know, nice, nice and easy, nothing crazy. And the, the key here is that we're writing unfiltered queries. You know, we're not excluding anybody from, from these results. It gets everybody. And all right, step three, I'm actually going to skip because like I said, I don't want to do everything for you. Um, I still want you guys to get some practice in. So step three, I'm going to leave you guys up to, but it's the same thing just from a different table. So nothing too crazy there. Um, same thing with step four. So we're actually going to skip three and four. All right, so let's talk a little bit about step five. So this one says uh, we're going to write an unfiltered query. Um, that returns multiple columns from a single table where you want to see a super key. Um, and a super key, so just to explain what a super key is, it kind of does a little here. A super key returns more than one row or a non-unique set. Um, a super key is often part of a natural key. Um, and they're throwing some terms out here at you, so I kind of want to help um, divide this up just a little bit. Right, so um, natural keys. How I like to define a natural key is is that it, it, it makes sense, it's logical. In fact, if it were me naming that key, I would have said it's a logical key. Um, they call it a natural key and I'm guessing because it's just natural, you know, it, it happens. But a natural key is something that's logical and a key I guess let me step back even further. A key is something that uniquely identifies a row. So, um, yes, uh, Bretton asked, do all these different keys need to be known for the vocabulary final? And the answer is yes, but one disclaimer I'll give you is that, you know, over the course of all these labs, I think you'll actually come to find that, like, like what I guess I'm saying is I wouldn't start just drilling them into my head now, you know, with notes. Um, because honestly, like, you'll use them so much that they just make sense. And then you'll just see the word, you'll know, and you'll have examples just fly into your brain. And that's actually what we really want. So if you want to, feel free to study them. But uh, you don't need to worry so much right now because um, this is very much an iterative process. And you might hear a, a key word now and you might forget it. But the next time you hear it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I kind of remember something about that. And then you'll forget it. And, but we're going to cover almost every concept multiple times throughout this term. Um, and, and pretty soon, you'll, you'll be feeling really good about it. That's one thing that I love about um, how this course is really lab-based is, is really you don't have to learn from a book. You kind of just learn by doing it. Um, and, and what's really nice about the SQL language is because these keywords, there's not really like translation there like when you see like a x key most of the time it's a keyword in the in the actual system so you'll be writing it frequently um but anyways a natural key and i kind of want to give you guys a good example of a natural key and to do that we're going to take a look at the address table so if we take a look at the address table um we have a city um state postal code and actually no that's not a great idea let's take a look at the uh, um, item table I forgot that that one okay the item table so here we have a couple different things we have the item barcode the item type and basically what the item table is is it is describing movies if we take a look at what's in our item table you'll notice that we have some classics like the Star Wars movies the hunt for the red October which is Honestly, probably my favorite movie that's in this, uh, this database. Um, cars. Um, I'm, I don't know. Some of these. Hook is also amazing. But our item table holds movies. And so some common things um, that you might come across in database, especially when you're designing them, which I always like to talk about because this class is, in fact, database design and development. Um, 
it, one thing that you're always having to think about is, you know, how, how you're going to build your data. Um, and when we talk about a key is we are talking about something that uniquely identifies any given row in a table. Um, so for example, if we want um, the Star Wars 3 movie, um, you know, something that uniquely identifies it right now is actually the, the title of the movie, which is Star Wars 3. But one thing that's important is what if we have Star Wars 3 DVD and Star Wars 3 Blu-ray? If you look up at our table, you'll notice that we have the item type, and that's actually where we track if it's a Blu-ray or a DVD, or you know, if we're going back to movie rentals, we're talking VHS. I hope there's still some people in here that know, remember the good old VHS days. Um, but you know, eventually we might have it to where Star Wars three is in here up to four times, or you know, an, an, we're not going to define how many times. And so we need a way to uniquely identify that row. And that's why we have, you'll notice every table has like an item ID or an address ID or a contact ID. And that's the primary key. And I've given this example before, but if you open up uh, an Excel wor worksheet or a Google Sheets, um, you'll notice that on the side, there's the little numbers. In fact, I'm going to open one up real quick. So these little numbers in, in, in an Excel spreadsheet, that is the, the primary key. You know, if you want record seven, that's never going to change. Record seven is, you know, there's only one record seven. There's only one record 14. And that is what the key is. Um, it uniquely identifies a row. And so in this case, um, the primary key is the primary, you know, the main key of the table. Well, if we look at what the instructions we're talking about with uh, a natural key is it defines a set of columns. And a natural key usually determined is based on multiple columns um, that uniquely identifies a row. So going back to our item table, and, you know, and this is something that naturally occurs in the real world. Um, you know, so we could say a natural key would be the item type and the, uh, you know, maybe there's more than one uh, Star Wars 1 title movie. You know, maybe there can be duplicates. Like, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but um, like Enchanted. I'm sure Enchanted's come out more than once or Cinderella. You know, the movie Cinderella probably will be released many times. Or another great example that's pretty recent is Mulan. Um, eventually, we're going to end up with multiple Mulans, whether they're both Blu-ray or both DVD. So item type and item title alone do not uniquely identify a row. However, maybe the item barcode plus the item type plus the item title all uniquely identify a row based on, on what it is. So similar to address. And the reason why you define these natural keys or we talk about these natural keys is, is important because it defines how we select data. Because for example, I this address table isn't a great one because we have contact ID in here and we don't have the street address ID because we have those split out in two different tables. But um, in another database I manage, the address table actually has a natural key in it because, let's see if we can show you here, the natural key in the address would be something along the lines of, um, you know, we have a country, state, city, zip, street name and number. So a natural key, because we don't want duplicate addresses in our table, right? Because only one person can live at an address at a time. Um, so what we do is we have a natural key across these because basically what we want to do is if someone moves and someone else moves into their house, we want to know about it. So, so that's why we have this unique 
natural this natural key. Another natural key might be uh, just throwing out some examples might be an email and a username. You know, we only want one people having a combination of email and username. That might be another natural key. And it all depends. And the reason why I like the term natural key or logic key is because it, it just makes sense and it depends on your business rules. It's not something that's set up. It's, it's like, well, well, you know, we're only going to have one email, you know, we're never going to have duplicate email in our system for accounts, something like that. So that's where those natural keys come in. So anyways, let's go back to the instructions here. And like I said, don't worry too much about it. It'll make sense as we go. All right, the natural key for the item table. Oh, what do you know? It's right here. <laughs> we, were, we were talking a little bit about that. So in this case, the natural key for the item table is the item type, item title, item subtitle, item rating, and item release, and the release date. And so basically what we're saying by a natural key is that there's no way the combination of all of these will ever be duplicated. Um, you know, someone might have the, for example, Mulan might have the same item title, might have the same item type, but the odds of the, you know, it could even have the same item subtitle. Let's say it's a re-release. Let's say that it, it obviously might have the same rating, but the release date will always be different. So therefore, it's natural or logical of us to say that, oh, the combination of all this data will never be duplicated or it will uniquely identify a row. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it. We've already spent a little bit of time on it, but and, and don't worry if you don't quite get it yet because it's going to make sense later on. So, um, okay, let's keep going. Um, and here's some of our surrogate keys. Um, and surrogate keys, if you guys know what the word surrogate means, um, surrogate, I guess I should say, um, they're in place of keys. And so item ID, obviously being a primary key, and item barcode, like I talked about, item barcode is probably probably uniquely identifies a, an item. So, for example, the barcode at Walmart, they're going to have maybe the old classic Mulan and the new Mulan. Those item barcodes are going to be different, even though every uh, other characteristic about them might be the same. So, obviously, the item barcode would be unique, meaning that if we scan that barcode, we're not going to get an error on our computer saying, oh, it could be a shirt or it could be uh, a movie you know no it's going to be one thing that's so that's where the the key works and and right now i hope you just kind of understand the idea of a key and it kind of gives some more examples um which is does this mean that a primary key is also a surrogate key um yes in a way um the only difference is that surrogate keys um the difference is that they can be created by human engineer policy if that makes sense because for example an item barcode might be um maybe you do duplicate barcodes um, but in this case it's not um So yeah, it gets a little fuzzy there, and 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 I guess um, it is a additional explanation. These specific terms, um, like surrogate keys, artificial keys, um, these ones aren't actually real defined in the database. So like if I tried to type surrogate key somewhere in my code, sur how do you spell that? Surrogate it's not going to be a keyword. Um, so those are kind of just more like concept terms. So, so it kind of just depends on whether it's a surrogate key or not, but that's a good question. And it can get deep. It's one of those, uh, it's one of those that I think some people could argue about for a little while. Um, <clears throat> but I guess what I'm saying is on step five, don't get so confused by this because it's just kind of trying to give you some information um, as you go along. 
Um, but really, at the end of the day, you're actually just selecting the same thing again. So I'm actually not even going to show you this one because really you're just selecting the item title, item rating, and item release date column values from the item table. So just like we did in steps uh, three, well, pretty much all of these. So we're actually going to skip step five too. Let's see. Let's go on to step six. Okay, perfect. We're finally to something new. So step six is, there's a big difference here. We're going to write a filtered query. And filtered query means that we're going to filter our data because so far we've been selecting, you know, we might only have selected two columns or three columns, but we selected those three columns for every row in the table. Now, as I'm talking, just remember that uh, when we talk about a table, um, the, the rows, so this way are records and this way is columns. I know that makes sense, but sometimes when we're talking, because um, the one nice thing about a spreadsheet is you can see it, but when we're just talking about it, sometimes it gets hard to remember. So we selected column A and B from our table for all the records. But now what we're going to start doing is we're going to start saying, I only want A and B for records 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12, and 13. Um, but we're going to do that smartly based on some value. So let's take a look here. So we're going to select the item title, the item rating, and the release date from item where the item rating equals an uppercase PG. So we're going to select all the movies. Um, we're going to select the movies or the items. We're going to get their title, their rating, and the day they were released um, for all of our PG rated movies. So this is kind of nice because like let's say you're, your Netflix and you want to search by movies based on the rating, right? Pretty, uh, pretty normal applicable use case, right? And I, I don't know if they have that, but I kind of wish they did. Um, but anyways, we're going to select some movies. And this is actually, while we're on it, this is actually the way all of your applications work. So when you're actually browsing through Netflix, um, you know, and you want to uh, filter um, the items based on their rating. It actually runs queries just like this in the back end, just so you know, because that's why we're learning this, right? It's not like everybody manually writes these every time. Um, you'll actually kind of build this in. So, but anyways, um, just to kind of add some perspective. So item rating. Oh, no, item title first. So we're going to get the item title. Item rating. And item release date from item. Now this is what we would have done before, right? We would have just done it just like this and we would get everything. All right, so there's all of our movies, but you'll notice that we have uh, rated PG-13, mature, teen, everyone, which are actually for video games. Uh, we have a not rated, we have uh, some rated G. Um, so what we want to do is we want to filter that down so it's only the rated PG movies. So to filter our data, we have to add one more clause, and that is the where clause. And the where clause is basically all about filtering data, and we can say where certain things are true. So in this case, we want it to be where item rating equals, and in this case, it says an uppercase PG. So we're actually going to just hard code that in there like that. And let's just, uh, well, let's save and run. And now you'll notice that our query only gives us movies that are PG. So not, not, not too crazy right? <clears throat> nice and easy. Um, does anyone have any questions about the where clause? And we're going to cover a lot more. And in fact, actually, real quick, I wanted to show you this. This was in the announcement, but I just kind of wanted to point it out again. Um, on my website, I thought it would be helpful to have a list of operators or a cheat sheet of how to filter data. Um, and I'm actually planning on making another little short video on on the process of filtering data, but this will give you an idea of kind of where to get started. So what we have is we have various different ways. So in this example, we use the equal sign. 
right? Um, we can use greater than, we can use less than, we can use greater than or equal to, um, not equal. Um, we can use between. Um, we can use like um, to do like a fuzzy search. So you can see here, and we're going to cover some of these in just a minute, so I don't want to spend too much time. And then also we can check to see if something is inside of a list. And there's some, uh, there's some examples here. Um, and yeah, let's keep going. We'll, uh, we'll cover those in just a minute. So let's keep going. So anyways, that's step six. Okay, so here's another good one. And I should actually add this to the list because I don't think it's there. Um, so we're going to do almost the same thing, but we're going to select, oh, did I miss an order by? Oh, yes, I did. Thank you. So um, one thing I missed in the instructions is ordering. So we need to add one more clause to our select statement because it says um, get all that information, filter it, and report it in ascending order by the item title column value. And basically when we, when we order something, it's depending on its data type, it's going to do it numerically or alphabetically. So in this case where we're ordering by the item title, basically it's like saying I want it sorted alphabetically. So we add the order by, and then we just tell the column that we want it to order by. So in this case, item underscore title. Now you'll notice that it said ascending. Um, by default, Oracle and any SQL database that I've ever worked with for that matter, will always default to ascending. So if I run this, now our movies will be in alphabetical order. We have a B, H, S, you know, Star Wars 1, 2, and 2. <laughs> and then the Chronicles of Narnia, TH, and TH, H. You know, so alphabetical order. Um, so it's ascending. If we want to, we could explicitly declare this. So let's just give this a run. I'll just run it manually so we can see. We're going to get the same results because it, it's doing ascending by default. If we want it descending, instead of the ASS for ASC for ascending, we will do DESC for descending. And if we do this, it will just give it to us in the reverse order, which is alphabetical backwards descending. And that works the same way with dates, the same way with numbers. So let's just get rid of that so we're back to the way it was. Thank you for catching that. All right, and moving on to step seven. So step seven here is we are going to uh, get another filter query. Um, we're going to return uh, people's full names. So the first name, middle name, and last name from the contact table. Um, we're going to pull the Sweeney family, um, but we only want it where their middle name is null. So we're going to filter based on that. So let's go ahead and write this one out. So we're going to select the first name, middle name, and last name. From contact and you know when I write my queries I know these are simple I always like to kind of just start with the basics let's just see the data okay there's my data um, and then I can begin to filter out so let's see what's our next uh, where the last name equals Sweeney okay so I'm only gonna want these three rows okay so let's do that where last name is equal to Sweeney then let's run that and make sure that we're uh, getting the proper results here. All right, so there's my three rows. Um, you'll notice that we have Ian that has a middle name or initial. Um, and we're going to want to cut that out because and middle name column value is null. So if we want to check for nulls, we say. So, and the other thing that I like to make sure people know is because we're going to type and. And just because we type and and not where, this is still all part of the where clause, if that makes sense. So even though we're typing and, this is still part of the where clause, we're still filtering data. We're just adding another one. If you're familiar with programming languages, it would be similar to saying if, uh, 
last name is equal to Sweeney, you know, and middle name is equal to null. You know, it would be similar to writing that in a programming language. That's essentially what we're doing. Um, so we're saying where last name is equal to Sweeney and middle name. Now in this case, you're gonna wanna go like this, something like that, but that doesn't actually work. You have to say is null. It's kind of one of those, those weird uh, SQL things. And I'm actually gonna add that to that table later because I kind of forgot about that one. So where last name is equal to Sweeney and middle name is null. So let's give this a run. Oh, guess we're just gonna have to type it. And you'll notice that we're down to our Sweeney people without a middle name. So that's how you check for, for nulls. Now the, the converse of that, let's say that we wanted to uh, only get the ones where that are not empty, which is pretty common. Because a lot of times you only want to see people that have like a certain piece of data. Um, so if we want to check to make sure that it's not null, so in this case, we're only going to get the ones with middle names and you just say is not null or is not empty. And then we only get Ian Sweeney because the other two had empty middle names. All right, moving on to step eight. So this one is a wildcard search. Um, and what we mean by a wildcard search is that sometimes we want to find uh, data based on like the first two letters of their name or, you, you know, something like that. So that's essentially what we're going to do because we are going to find people whose last name starts with V-I-Z. And the other thing is that we may want to take out case sensitive. So this is really popular. Um, probably every time you Google searching search, you know, it's doing stuff. You know, if you're doing a search in your address book, it's doing something like this. Cause you might type, um, you know, if I'm searching for, you know, my dad's phone number, I might just type DAD. I don't capitalize it. Um, I don't capitalize people's first and last names maybe when I'm searching, but it still finds them. And that's essentially what we're going to do here. So what we're going to do is we are going to find the Visquel family based on the first three letters, of their last name. So we're going to get the first middle and last name column values. And what do you know? That's probably very similar to this one. So we're just going to take the top portion of that and put it just there like that. Save some typing. And there's our 12 rows with all of our people. And we want it where the last name starts with a case insensitive VIZ string. And you'll notice it has a little hint here. It says you need to promote the column value or the string literal value and or to uppercase or demote them to lowercase to find matching values. So there's functions in SQL that you can use to do various things just like that. So what we need to do is we need to write our where clause to filter and where last name. So let, let's try this. So if I say VIZ, okay, let's have a poll in the chat. Am I going to get any rows returned? No, yeah, perfect. No row selected. So, and that's because we don't have any last names that are all lowercase viz. Um, we do have, uh, we have, you know, the this, I don't like how to spell. Um, so let's try this. Now am I gonna get any rows? Still no, some people say two. Let's take a look. So if I run this, I still get no rows selected. And that's because I use the lowercase v 
and this is an uppercase V. So you can see it's very picky, which is good. We want it to be picky, but that means that we have to we have to account for user error, like in this case where I didn't capitalize the last name um, because there isn't a last name that equals Visquel. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of compensate for user error and we're going to make it easier. And so what we're going to do instead is we're going to make this so it's case insensitive. So You'll notice that this is all lowercase string literal, which means that it's just, we just typed it there manually. What we're gonna do is we're going to make last name lowercase. And just to show you what this does, so if I select lower last name from contact, we get all their last names, all in lowercase now. So that's essentially what we're doing there, and we can just see it. So where the lower last name is equal to viz. Um, so now let's do another little pop quiz. Am I gonna get any rows now? More no's, which is absolutely right because it's still just V-I-Z. And so the last part of this, I mean, and, and at this point, if we actually typed in Visquel, um, we would actually pull rows now because at this point, you know, we're comparing um, both of them. And you'll notice that the last name still shows up as uppercase because we're only changing this condition to lower. But as per the instructions, we don't want to be able to find them just by typing this. So what we do, just like here, is we want to search for a pattern. And so we're going to use like. So instead of an equal sign, we're going to type like. Now, if I try to run this, I'm still not gonna find anything because we're missing one more piece. And that's because when we use the like operator, we have to specify where we want to be open for suggestions essentially, or where we're, we don't care. And the wild card is a percent sign. So in this case, I want to look for last names that start with V-I-Z. and then we end up with our results. Um, you have to use the, lo the like keyword because if I change like to this, what is it looking for? It's actually looking for V-I-Z percent sign. The percent sign with an equal sign is actually a really just a percent sign. Just like if I had someone in our database who was um, last name was viz percent then it would find them um, and so to make that percent sign be a wild card you have to use like does that make sense because when we use an equal sign it is doing a hard comparison so if you want to do fuzzy search you have to look for Yep, so if we added a percent sign at the beginning, it would look for people whose um, last name ended with viz. Or like if we want to do this, we could say QEL. And we get the same results, just the other way around. Let's see if there's any that have like a similar or like if we want to find everybody who's last, uh, well, there's no duplicates. Um, we can also see, yep. You know, let's try it. So it works just like you would kind of expect. You guys are starting to kind of already see it just a little bit um, where, that, where that comes in handy. Um, anytime you put a wild card, it means that it's open. Um, now, if we take away one, that means that it must start with an E, right? But if I put a percent sign before, it basically means that it contains an E at that point, right? So 
So yeah, it works kind of just like you would expect it to. It's a, I like to call that a fuzzy search because um, a lot of times, you know, there's lots of websites where you'll start typing and it'll give you suggestions. And that's because every time you add a letter to, to the field, it actually runs this. So like, let's say that I had a variable called uh, user search, right? And I could actually put this right here. I could say like user, well, we would do this. So we would actually do something like that that would let us, uh, you know, find um, stuff that looks like we're looking for. In fact, you know, let's uh, we could do it. So we could actually create a session variable right here inside of our here so if we go back to lab one because I kind of want to show you this because it's kind of cool in lab one we actually uh, create a variable and in this case we call it bind variable so what I'm actually going to do is we're actually going to create one we're going to say variable if I can type right variable user search And it is a varchar to, and let's just say 60 length. We say begin, and then we're gonna say user search is equal to, and in this case, I'm just gonna type, just like our little uh, example, um, we're just gonna set it to viz. So let's uh let's run this. Oh, wrong window. Oh, and it looks like I oh, huh. Because what we need is our there we go. Now you'll notice we're getting Visquel. So let's say that, you know, and obviously this would be happening in real time, but just to simulate how this would work, um, you know, I could then change this to, and every time you type, it actually kicks off another search and returns the results. So then as I type, you know, it's going to, to change. So kind of just a cool little example there. Obviously you don't have to do that. You can just type it in manually, but, but that's how those fuzzy searches work. So when you start typing something and it's finding suggestions, this is actually what it's doing in the background. It just adds a letter each time and slowly filters the results. Okay, and someone asked, uh, doesn't using a function in a where triggers a table scan on a DB with millions of records, would this be costly? Is that right? So I don't want to get too much into tuning right now. Later on, we will definitely talk about it, but you're absolutely right. Um, in fact, we're going to hit just a little bit more on it in here in just a second when I show you another website. But um, when you're talking about, you know, when you get up to massive tables, um, the way you write your queries are very different and so like as an example I have one query that I actually have to step away from my computer and it runs for like 10 minutes um, to pull all the data just because it's a lot of data and there's a lot of logic in it and you know it is what it is but um, but the, depending on how you write your query can have different cost on on CPU power on your server so especially if you're designing databases and building queries writing software um, for applications that lots of people are going to be using, you definitely want to make sure that you're writing queries that are efficient. 
Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. I don't want to get too much into it because the where clause doesn't necessarily um, run a scan. Um, it all depends on your keys. Um, again, those keys, the, that keyword again, you'll hear that constantly, especially when it comes to tuning um, and indexes, the way you index your table, which we're not going to go into that now. Just know that there's things you can do to make it faster. And when we start talking next week about doing joins between two tables in our select statements, that's when it becomes more important. And we're going to talk a little bit more. I'm glad you brought it up, but for right now, don't worry too much about it. I don't want to get anyone freaked out, but, um, but yeah, the where clause isn't bad at all. Um, and, and using a function in a where clause um, can have some issues, but, you know, most of the time it can't be avoided. Do we have to write all of our steps down in KWrite or does the lab just keep track? You have, to, so these ones, you have to, you have to write them all in KWrite um, because these are actually just like, it's just a script. So you, and, and at the end of the day, this is actually one of the files you're going to submit. And so you'll want all your code in here. Um, so you have it and then that way when you run it, because here I'll show you how it's going to work here in just a minute. But yeah, you'll want to put them all in your KWrite into your apply Oracle lab 2.sql file. Basically, it's just a text file with a fancy extension. But it's a script. So every time we run this, it actually runs everything that I have. But if I were to delete something, it then quits running it. And the log file gets overwritten every time. So if you want to have a history of your work or your steps, you have to put them in here, just like answering a, an essay in a Word document, essentially. But the only difference is we can run ours, which is kind of cool. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. That was step eight. Okay, so step nine is we are going to filter another one, um, but we're going to do something a little bit different. So we're going to get the city, state, province, postal code. Let's start there. And let's take a look. And again, because I can't remember off the top of my head what all is in that table. So we're gonna take a look here, state, province, and postal underscore postal code from address. And again, I always kind of like to just run mine as we go. So you can kind of see what's coming back at you. All right, and then, um, where the city column value is found in the set of Provo and San Jose. Um, now there's two ways we can do this, um, that the instructions are kind of hinting at one specifically, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna show you both ways so you can kind of understand the difference. So I'm gonna show you the longhand way first, the way that the instructions are not necessarily hinting at, um, but basically, we're looking for all the addresses that are either in Provo or San Jose. So what we're going to look at is where city is equal to Provo or, I guess we need to finish that off, or city is equal to San Jose. Now, what I like to do is basically in these where clauses, it works just like math, where if I put this in parentheses, I can view this as a single statement. So where city is equal to Provo or city is equal to San Jose. And the reason I like to put the parentheses around there because we just basically want this to evaluate true. And so either this or that. Because sometimes depending on how you put them in there, it can be this and this or that. So I like to put, anytime I use or essentially, I like to put my or statement in parentheses. But let's give this a run and let's see what we get. So here we can see that the cities are in San Jose or Provo. So that's one way. Now the way that they kind of hint at is they want you to use a different operator called in. So Provo, San Jose. Basically with the in clause, or the in operator I should say, 
um, we basically can give it a list. And as long as, and I guess we need this city here, where city is in, as long as the city that we're looking at is in Provo or San Jose, we're gonna see it in the results. So you'll notice we get the same 11 rows, same exact data set, just two different ways to do it. One, I think this one's just a little bit easier. Anytime I use like a list, um, I, I really like using that in. Now you'll notice it also talks about an any operator. And I did that a little wrong, but the any, any operator is a little bit different. In this case, you want to use in to get those ones. So that one kind of just throws that one out there, I think, so you can look it up. <clears throat> but that one looks for inequality or equality. So um, we'll talk a little bit about any in the future. I wouldn't worry so much about it now. Just know for them, this one you're going to write in. All right, and then finally we have um, a select statement that's going to use the between clause. Now I'm gonna leave this one up to you guys so you can kind of see a little bit um, of, so you can kind of have a little challenge, I guess you could say. Um, but just know that on my website here that's in the notes on the, for the week, um, there is a nice little between example here. Um, in fact, let's just copy this and let's see if we can make it run. Um, basically, the between operator is going to look, it's pretty easy. So we're looking for movies that were released between two dates. And I guess in this case, we need the item release date and where the item rating is not equal to R because, oop, and I need to change it up here too. So you can see here, we're almost doing the same thing, but we just say where item release date, which is a date, is between these two dates. And you just separate them with an and. And in this case, we get no rows selected because none were obviously released between the 1st of January 83 and the 31st of January 83. Um, so basically we're looking for a single month. Um, but that's step 10 and I'm going to leave you guys up to that one because I don't want to do too much and we've already done quite a bit. So, um, I think that's the last one. Let's just double check. Yep. So step 10 is the, the last one. So this lab's actually kind of nice and nice and fun. I think it's kind of fun. Um, I actually know students already who have pretty much gone through it all. Um, so it shouldn't be too bad. Does anyone have any questions? Um, why pull up a website because I do want to show you one more thing but if you have any questions feel free pretty quiet all right well one thing I wanted to kind of show you is on this Michael McLaughlin how should we format the dates um, don't worry about the format oh when you're doing this um, in Oracle it's day day dash capital M-O-N, so the abbreviation all caps, um, and then dash, just the last two year values. So just like that. So day, month, YY for year. All right, and how to log into the console to get it running. Um, yeah, I'll show you that real quick one more time. Let's close the window. So if we open up a fresh console, and then, well, let me back up. What I like to do is go to the lab you're working on. So if we're on lab two, what I like to do is click, right click in this empty white space, and then go to actions, and then say open terminal here. And this will have your terminal open, but then you type SQL plus student forward slash student. Hit return and you're good. Yeah, I actually don't like the the Oracle date format myself either. I'm more of a um, American day, day like this. And I really am a big fan of 
the full end year. And I do like that date format too. For all my actual reports, I use uh, four year dash mm dash day day. Um, I'm not too picky though, um, but it is a little confusing because I work with, I actually work with SQL Server and Postgres all day. And so to, to work with Oracle on the few occasions that I do, it's hard for my dates to go back. All right, so once you finish, so let's uh, say we're, we're all done. And that's not, we'll call that step 10 and a half since it's not actually the step. When you're all done, I'm glad you brought that up, Jason. So when we're all, uh, or Josephine, um, and I'll talk about the website here in a minute. So when you're all done, we're all done, you wanna run it first of all. So at apply Oracle lab 2sql you want to make sure it runs and hopefully you've been running it along the way. Um, and then once it's all done running, inside of your lab here, your directory, you will have a log file. And that log file will correspond to whatever name you have here. And if you leave it by the default, it's apply oracle lab 2.txt. So right here is my log file. And if I take a look in here, you'll notice that it has all my queries and the output, right? And this is actually what I'm gonna grade because you can have all the right code, um, but maybe something was messed up in a previous step, or maybe you don't have any data in your table. And in that case, you would get zero rows selected, which not that I, I'm not gonna necessarily dock you for, but we wanna know so we can help you get it working because these labs kind of start building on each other eventually. So that's why we like to see the log files is so we can make sure, you know, hey, they have all the people in their database that they need to, for example. So when you're all done, what you're gonna do is you're gonna log into Canvas with Google right here, um, and you're just gonna upload these two files. And Canvas will let you upload two files. So just go ahead and submit both the apply oracle lab 2sql file and the apply oracle lab 2.txt file. And each week, that's always gonna be the same. You're gonna submit your .sql file where you wrote all your code, and then you're gonna submit the, the log file that shows all of your code. Yep, absolutely. And in fact, Brenton, um, I don't know if you've caught this from other videos, but I hope you resubmit even after the due date um, because I actually will regrade your lab um, for a whole 100% because let's face it, we're all human, we're all gonna make mistakes. And the whole point of learning is, uh, in my opinion, is very iterative. And I want you to go back and fix your mistakes. Yep, and Google Chrome is in your, your virtual computer. Um, so this is actually your virtual computer desktop. So you can just open Google Chrome right there on there. So yep, resubmit as many times as you need. Um, if you need to resubmit after the due date, it doesn't lock, you can keep resubmitting. Um, my end goal is that you have the right solution and you'll get points for going back and correcting any mistakes because that only makes sense. All right, so um, to finish off, what I kind of want to give you is a last little set of reading, I guess you could say. I know I said there wouldn't be much reading, but um, but this website is actually extremely critical and we're gonna talk a lot about it next week when we talk about joins. Um, and it goes back to that cost performance um, that I think uh, Jonathan brought up. I'm sorry if I got the name wrong, but uh, whoever talked about, yeah, it was Jonathan. Uh, when we talked about uh, performance and, and how when we write our queries, it can have effects on how long it takes, which then impacts our systems. And, you know, maybe we crash the server, you know, stuff like that. So, so essentially what we want to do is we want to make sure we write good stuff. So, and this is really important. So um, if you go to michaelmclaughlin.info forward slash db1, and I'm just going to paste this into the, into the chat here. Um, there's an article um, right here underneath tutorial pages is just right down here and it says articles and it says select statement. 
And this is huge. Um, what I would suggest is that you go through all this um, and, and kind of browse it a little bit. But the most important part here is the execution order of clauses in a select statement. This is massive. Um, and I'm not saying you have to have it memorized by next week. Not, not at all. But what I'm saying is, is kind of just like start thinking about it because depending on what you have in your select statement, um, it does different things. And uh, I don't want to get too in depth right now, but um, just because we write select first doesn't mean that's what the computer does first because it actually starts with the from clause, then the where clause, then the select clause. So it kind of bounces around a little bit. Um, but we'll talk a lot about it. And I think when we're done talking about it, you'll be like, oh, that makes total sense. Um, but we'll do that next week. So if you want to kind of get like a preview or kind of just pre prep yourself for next week, um, you know, put it on the back burner, but this is a great little article that I think you can read. And also if you have any questions about specific clauses, this is an, another great one um, to talk about. So Anyways, um, does anyone have any questions before we go? Okay. Um, if no one has any questions about the lab, I, I will end the recording. Um, I'll give people just a few more minutes if they want to offer, and then uh, I'll hang around for just, just a few minutes, and we can take care of any other issues after. Um, if you're heading out after this, thank you for being here. Uh, your questions and comments are awesome and they make a big difference. Um, so thanks for being here and good luck this week. And if you have any questions, just reach out.